The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him. Or your accuser may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him get her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard it said that to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I was wondering if anyone else noticed this article that was in uh, the Sedalia Democrat earlier this week. Uh, Charlotte painted over it before I could get to it a, a second time. But I think the title was Sinkhole Not Worsened by Super Bowl Halftime Flushing. <laughs> Did anyone see that? Couple? Okay. Well, this was, this was an article. I mean, the title itself meant you had to read it. So it was an article talking about the sinkhole in Fraser, Michigan, just outside of Detroit, which happened probably a month or more ago. It was caused by this sewer line breaking. But city officials there in this area were nervous amount, about the amount of toilets that would be flushed during the halftime of the Super Bowl and whether that would cause more damage to this sinkhole. Maybe you're as confused as I am. Because I was thinking, wasn't the Super Bowl in Houston, Texas? And, but we're talking about Detroit, Michigan, which is nearly a part, as far apart north and south as you can get in this country. I mean, my first thought that early in the morning was, that's a really long sewer line. <laughs> Mind you, I hadn't had my morning coffee yet. But after the wheels were turning, I started figuring it out that this one event that was happening in in one part of the country was having such widespread effects that people on the other side of the country were worried about how many toilets would be flushed at the same time. Like I said, this was the first thing after I got up, but this blew my mind. How can a football game in Texas affect a sewer line in Michigan? Well, have you ever heard of the butterfly effect? It's this overly complicated scientific theory that more or less says that small causes can have really large effects. I mean, the name comes from the example of 
The tiniest wind disturbance caused by a butterfly flapping its wings in one part of the country at one moment in time, causing a hurricane in another part of a country after time has elapsed. I mean, it's used a lot in weather science, but this butterfly effect can be applied to nearly everything else, like football and sinkholes and toilets. But just a couple days after I read that article about sinkholes, I was flipping through the channels of the TV one night and I came across the show, The City in the Sky. Not talking about sewer lines floating in the sky, but, but rather everything else that goes into flying, you know, airports, airplanes, all those de details that make it possible for us. And so they showed this one airport, and I think it was Atlanta, but because this airport was so huge and had so many terminals, they had a subway to go from one terminal to the other. And they interviewed the guy who's in charge of overseeing this subway. And he said that his job is important because if there is just one small hiccup in the schedule, one brief breakdown in these trains, it could potentially cause massive effects on connecting flights around the country, and around the world. It's amazing how one thing, one seemingly isolated and, and possibly even very minor event, can have such a far-reaching impact. For these past couple of weeks, our gospel lessons have all been from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We still have one more to go. Like we've been saying, in Matthew's Gospel, this is the first time Jesus did something we read about in public. We heard about his baptism and his temptation in the wilderness, and then he comes out and says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And then he calls his disciples, and he goes and teaches and preaches and heals. And, and then these crowds gather, and they, they kind of maybe chase him up a hill. But he goes up the hill, and he sits down, and we get the Sermon on the Mount. He begins, obviously, as we heard, with teaching what the kingdom looks like, who is blessed, how life is different because of it. He teaches about who we are and who God has created us to be and why we should act like it. And in the midst of all of this, it sounds like he's saying that what we do and why we do it matter. Not just matters to us, but matters to everyone and matters for the sake of the kingdom. I mean, Jesus didn't come up with the term butterfly effect in the Sermon on the Mount, but he seemed to be hinting about the effect that we do have on one another. In today's portion of his teaching, we hear these four different laws that he talks about. The Jewish faith was always grounded in God's laws, laws that would shape how the Jewish people lived with one another and lived in relationship with God. Now Jesus is clear that he's not saying that because everything's changed that we don't have to worry about these laws. No, on the contrary, we heard last week Jesus say, I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill. So he's not saying we don't have to follow these laws. Really, he's saying we probably need to follow them more. Because what we do matters. Relationships matter. And you don't just destroy or break relationships by murdering somebody in that relationship, but also when you insult them or hold a grudge against them or are angry with them, those things can damage a relationship as badly as murder can. And yes, committing the physical act of adultery hurts everyone involved, but so does thinking about it. Even the, the simplest things you think have a far greater effect than we can imagine. The same with divorce or swearing against the Lord. Those have far greater reach and impact than we usually think about. And of course, there's always more to those issues than what's at face value. But he's saying really small causes can have really large effects. So luckily for us today, we don't get just one sermon, but two sermons in our lessons for today's worship. Our first lesson was from Deuteronomy and is part of what many would consider Moses' final sermon. 
It was one of his farewell addresses to the Israelites as they were preparing to enter the promised land. So, so Moses takes this opportunity to say, don't forget what you've learned these past 40 years. You know, in front of you, in all your days, you will encounter life and prosperity, death and adversity, says Moses. I mean, what would that mean for us? Especially if we think about a, a life and death situation. Because usually we reserve that term for when our physical lives are truly in danger and where the decision we make will either mean that we live or that we die. But what if we changed our thinking a bit on that? What if we thought about life and prosperity as living our lives in the presence of God or in the kingdom of God or among God's people in community and with one another? Then we could think of death and adversity as the opposite, life apart from God, life without relationship with one another, life that affects others negatively. Then maybe we could ask the question of everything. I mean, everything that we do, whether it's life or death. Or, you know, maybe specifically, does it bring life or bring death? We hear that Moses chooses option A. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. I mean, choosing life doesn't just have an effect on you, it affects everyone. Your family, your friends, your descendants, someone on the other side of the globe you'll never meet. What we do matters. What we do, the decisions we make, the things we think, they all have a huge impact on the greater whole. I mean, cause and effect is no joke. Think about it. In every decision if, that we make, if we ask if this brings life or death, would that change how we act? I mean, every decision. Hmm, should I flush the toilet now? Who would have ever thought that that would have that kind of effect or have an effect on anyone else? But yet we heard that there are times that those things can and might affect others. In this whole season of Epiphany, we continue to hear themes of justice for one another and living righteously so that the kingdom can be realized among us. This is the life that Jesus calls us to. This is the life that the light of Christ and the light of the star have beckoned us to follow up, to follow so that we and our descendants may live. Jesus continues to call us to something bigger than just ourselves. Because it's not only about us anymore. It's about our relationships. It's about our community. It's about this kingdom. It's about making choices that bring about life to all of those things. Not just what's best for me, myself, and I. When we have life I mean, we have life when we live in God. And when we live in God, we live with one another. And that's always great news because when we're faced with death and adversity, we can know that we aren't alone, knowing we have God and one another in our midst. And especially in today's climate, how helpful and even comforting could it be to think of we instead of just me? And as we think of we, how could we together choose life? And how can those choices we make bring life not to just us, but to everyone around us? Amen.